Okay. So it's a pleasure to be here to talk to you about uh, AR and the future of augmented reality. So I'm going to begin by making sure that we're all on the same page and by defining virtual reality. And virtual reality, basically the way that researchers define it, refers to the idea of a computer-generated world of virtual media, 3D, interactive, and tracked in position and orientation relative to the user. So if that's VR, what's AR? AR basically is all of the above, okay? Uh, but also registered in 3D with a perceptible real world. And what you're seeing here, in fact, is a AR display. This one is the Meta 2 dev kit, which we actually have here. You'll get a chance to perhaps get a demo of later. And you'll hear more about that when Ryan Pamplin talks after me. So what I want to do, if this is working properly, is to give you a very quick overview of some of the technology that we're talking about. I'm going to concentrate in particular on the notion of using AR um, to be able to see things around you. AR refers to all the different kinds of media that we can perceive, but I'm going to talk right now specifically about AR that's visual. So there's three basic ways in which we can let you see augmented reality. The first kind, which is actually the oldest, um, is what's called optical see-through. And what you're seeing over here is, I'm not sure this pointer is actually working, but um, we have a person who is uh, looking at a display which is reflected in this case from optics. So this is the idea of using mirrors and as well lenses to be able to let a person see a display and at the same time also see out to the real world. So the combination of real and virtual occurs in optics. The second kind is what we call video see-through in which you are looking at a display but the real world is seen by cameras. And the camera view and the virtual graphics are combined in the computer and then presented on the display. So combined in optics versus combined in the computer. And then finally, we can actually project into the real world. We can spray photons into the real world. And then we can do the combination in the real world itself, combined in the environment. And in these very schematic pictures, I'm leaving out exactly where things really are. And that's that the display can be worn, for example, it's as part of a head-worn display, as you'll be seeing in some of the imagery that I'll be showing. Um, it can be held in the hand, as in handheld AR, and it can even involve having some of those components in the environment. Now, it turns out that AR and VR actually are quite old technology. Uh, there has been research on AR and VR that goes back to basically around 50 years ago, starting in the work that Ivan Sutherland did with his students at Harvard and published in 1968. And so this actually is a picture of that very first optical see-through head-worn display. So what I want to do right now is to talk very briefly about a set of different application domains that I think are really good ones for AR. And I'm going to demonstrate these with some video and as well also uh, some still images from research that my students and I have been doing for the past 25 years or so. So the first domain I'm going to talk about is that of navigation, travel, tourism. And this is an example, um, this particular one from the very early 2000s um, of a version of a system that we started in the mid-90s. This was a backpack-based computer back before there were smartphones that are more powerful than our backpack uh, back then was today. Um, looking, for example, uh, through that um, head-worn display, and in this case, seeing some information about a restaurant, the kind of stuff I would like to be able to do without having to pull out my smartphone. Uh, workspaces, um, another example here from over 20 years ago, in which instead of having to look at a flat monitor, the idea of being able to be literally surrounded with the kind of content that we currently work on, 2D and as well also 3D. In this case presented uh, some 20 odd years ago on a very old fashioned optical see-through display. Uh, games, games are incredibly important um, for VR but also for AR. 
And what you're seeing over here is an example of a game played by having the system track in position and orientation a pattern board. You can see me playing with it in the upper right hand corner. And of course, all of the virtual stuff that you're seeing is being added on, in this case, with the video see-through as we're playing around, rolling this little ball around uh, past a set of obstacles. Now, one thing I really want to talk about and concentrate on for most of my talk is an incredibly important domain uh, for a variety of different purposes, including uh, industrial ones, and that is task assistance, trying to assist people in performing skilled tasks and doing these things more quickly and doing these things more accurately than we can when using conventional documentation. So in particular, I'm going to talk about a couple of examples of some of this work done in my lab. What you're going to see now is one eye of an optical see-through display filmed by actually having a camera inside of a dummy head, and that dummy head is being held as someone is working around it. Um, and uh, what I'm going to let you do is to see what this actually looks like. This is a task that involves assembling the combustion chamber for an aircraft engine, and we're going to see overlay documentation seen through one eye of this stereo display. And so in this case, what we're looking at is through that single eye, we're seeing overlay graphics showing us which particular uh, bottom portion of the chamber to select. We're going to put it on top of this little uh, turntable, and then we're going to select the top part again with that red arrow pointing to it and highlight over there, put it on top. All these parts are tracked so the system automatically knows when the part's in place. In this case, the arrow is telling us we need to orient it properly relative to the bottom. And then we turn it until those guys line up. And then we're going to put some pins through. This is actually a task that we did in a user study to investigate how well this kind of technology would actually work. So we put our Second pin in over there, and we're done with the task. So important take home lesson over here, we actually, in my lab, we build systems like this, and then we do studies with people to try to see how well those systems work, um, how fast they are to use, how many mistakes people make. And it turned out, to make a very long story short, that we compared AR with a more conventional LCD flat panel screen which you're in fact able to see on the right over there in that condition. Um, and we were able to show that AR is significantly faster and more accurate than using the flat panel display to present this kind of information. Not even counting the fact that in both cases here we were actually automatically going on to the next task, something that normally current flat panel based documentation wouldn't do. It took literally around half the time to do it in AR than to do it with the conventional documentation. Now, in addition to having AR being used to assist a person operating by themselves, there's one very important kind of scenario that's used in many, many different application domains, and that's remote task assistance, in which you want to have a remote expert, which uh, is known in industry as a subject matter expert, or SME, and I'll call it SME, so you'll know what that uh, acronym means, and you want to have them assisting a local technician who's actually at the task site itself. And this is really important because very often the person at the task site is younger, they have less experience, and that older, wiser person who's probably back at the corporate headquarters um, does not necessarily want to travel, may even be thinking about retiring soon. And so we want to be able to capture and have them be able to assist remotely um, this person who's actually in the field. So two main goals that our SME or subject matter expert uh, has to fulfill. One of them is getting that technician to the right place to perform the task. This is basically the where problem. And the other is actually helping that technician perform the task itself. And so I'm going to show you some video from some of the work that we've done in trying to explore this. Um, this is one still from a video that I'm, I'm going to show you. It's going to go by very fast. In this case, our technician, excuse me, our remote expert, has a scaled-down model of an aircraft engine. We actually physically have the engine in my lab, 
and you can see the hand of that remote expert, and they're pointing at a little tiny scale model that's on a little turntable in front of them, and they're selecting a representation of where they want to have that technician go. And then our technician, as you will see in the video, is going to be walking over to this thing that looks a bit like a window, which is telling them they need to look through it to be able to see what our remote SME wants them to see. So here we're seeing our remote expert who's rotating that little table, and what he sees in video see-through AR is this little model of this engine. There's a bunch of iconic representations of the different places that our technician can be. He selects one of them, and now our technician, wearing a video see-through display, walks over. He's going to look through that window, and the reason he can walk over there is he sees this on the screen, this representation of the window. He walks over to it. He looks through it, and now he sees the tracked hand of that remote expert pointing out something that's important for him to look at. So it turns out that we've actually done studies with this uh, kind of approach, and we in fact have uh, another approach we've used uh, more recently, which I'm not going to have too much time to tell you about. This is actually a better way of doing it, in which we have this thing that looks very much like a big airbag, all virtual, and that big airbag is a target for the head of the technician. So the technician is going to use that to very quickly put his head inside of it, and then we do a couple of other things um, to be able to get them to make sure they look in the right direction. This is a way of being able to express a range of different possible positions and orientations that are appropriate for the particular task. So once we get the person in the right place, then we need to get them to perform the task correctly. And so what you're seeing here are a couple of stills. I'll show you some video in a couple of seconds. Um, and these are representing, as set up by our remote expert, the task to perform. And so in this case, you're seeing the bottom part of that combustion chamber on the left. There is a virtual representation of where the top part needs to go on top of it. The physical top part is at the lower right. And this is part of the way in which our remote SME is showing, literally demonstrating, to the local technician how to perform the task. And we also see some colored rubber band lines that are connecting corresponding points on the top and bottom to make it very easy for that local technician to get things in the right uh, orientation and position. So, as I said, uh, we have a remote expert and a local SME, uh, excuse me, a remote expert and a local tech, and our local technician is going to work in AR, and we'll see what that looks like in a couple of seconds, and our remote expert is going to work in VR. So our remote expert has a completely virtual 3D representation of the relevant, important components in the environment that the technician is working in, and they're going to be able to see what the technician is doing in full 3D, and they'll be able to manipulate copies of those things to demonstrate what needs to get done. And I should mention they're also able to talk with each other. That's really the easy part. So here we're going to see what it looks like. Um, we're going to look through in a couple of minutes, look through the eyes of our local technician. We're going to see them first, a third-party view. We're going to see the tasks they perform. I'll show you another task we actually used in a study. And then we're going to look through the eyes of our local technician and see what they see with the head-worn display that they're wearing. So in the inset at the upper right, we see a view of our remote SME, and on the screen you're seeing what they're seeing in their head-worn display. And you can see it's basically showing the SME what the technician is doing. This is a task we used in our study. This is a much harder task. Uh, there's many different positions and many different orientations of which the SME has to communicate the right one. And then what we're going to see in a couple of seconds is a view through the eyes of the technician. So here they're holding the real top part of this combustion chamber, and they're going to position it in place. And when it's right, then our SME is going to be able to tell them that it's correct. And what does it look like from the standpoint of the remote expert? 
We're going to see what they look like from a third party view, and then we're going to see through their eyes in this purely virtual environment that they're working in. So here they're going to pick up a copy of that top, and they're going to use that to demonstrate how to place the top part on top of the bottom part correctly. So this is all done in full 3D, virtually in the case of the SME. And so now what we're going to see is a alternative. This is, represents very much what people are currently doing in industry. This is a sketching approach in which one sketches in 2D on a representation of the world. And all the sketching gets sent into the world itself. And as it turned out, to make a long story short, um, we did a study, we do studies of stuff in my lab, and we were able to show that that demonstrational 3D approach is significantly faster than the 2D approach. Uh, basically, that full 3D interaction is better than 2D drawing. Last thing I want to mention in the remaining minute or two um, is my sense of where things are heading. I'm a great believer in head-worn displays, but I really don't think that everything else is going to disappear all that soon. And so I believe in having these things work together. What you're seeing here is a view through one eye of a video see-through display of an urban uh, visualization domain. This is a part of downtown Manhattan. You're seeing on a rear-projected flat panel display, excuse me, rear-projected uh, uh, a tabletop display, you're seeing the footprints of buildings, and you're seeing rising up from those footprints 3D models. This is a real image. And the reason this works is because we're viewing this through a video see-through head-worn display. And so in this work, we're combining a shared tabletop with personal head track see-through displays and also with personal tracked phones. And then on top of that, in this case, we're going out to a variety of social media uh, databases. We're getting georeferenced information. We're overlaying all of that in these little pictogram arrays that you're seeing attached to the buildings over here. And so to give you an idea of what this looks like, we're going to view through one eye of a video see-through display. And so here, we're looking around part of Manhattan. Can you guess where we are? If you've been in Manhattan, you may recognize the Flatiron Building. This is the Flatiron District. This is all being seen through a video see-through display. And because it is a multi-touch tabletop, we can scale and translate and rotate. So think of this as an application for urban planning, uh, urban visualization. And then on top of this, because we have all of that georeference data represented pictorially, we can simply reach out with, in this case, a tracked phone. And we can look at the same database. So we're in the same 3D environment looking at databases. In this case, we can select something that we want to find out more information about. This happens to be a database of noise information, noise complaints. So I've talked to you briefly about uh, several domains that I think are going to be extremely important for uh, AR, uh, task assistance of various sorts, um, and this notion of uh, hybrid user interfaces combining many, many different kinds of technology. The important point I want to make from all of this is that AR is real after 48 years worth of research. Um, we are now finally starting to see some real hardware and real software, um, some examples of which you're going to see very shortly, that can make this a fundamental, crucial part of the way in which human beings interact with computers. And I will stop at this point and acknowledge the many colleagues, students, and funding agencies that made this possible. Thank you.